Today's webinar will be on what causes marine heat waves and how are they changing and will be provided by Professor Neil Holbrook from the University of Tasmania. Neil is a Professor of Ocean and Climate Dynamics and Head of the Centre for Oceans and Cryosphere in the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies at the University of Tasmania. He's a lead uh, investigator of component two of the Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub Project 2.3 on decadal scale predictability of ocean temperature extremes. And he's also a chief investigator of the ARC Centre for Excellence of Climate Extremes. Neil also has over 25 years of experience researching the ocean's role in climate, ocean and climate variability and extremes. And he previously led the National Climate Change Adaptation Research Network for Marine Biodiversity and Resources. And he's currently a fellow for the Australian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society. So I might hand over now to Neil to get started with the uh, webinar. And if you have any questions or concerns um, throughout, please write me a little message in the chat box. Over to you, Neil. Thanks. All right. <laughs> thanks very much, Sonia. And thanks, everybody, for uh, joining the webinar. Um, Today, I'm just going to give a bit of a broad overview of what marine heat waves are, and uh, I'm going to talk about things like significant marine heat waves around the world and their impacts, um, a definition of what a marine heat wave is and how we apply it. Um, I'll talk about uh, trends in marine heat waves and, and projections. I'll talk about categories of marine heat waves, um, a little bit about what causes them. And then I'll just finish off by saying a little bit about um, uh, the potential to predict them. So uh, the whole concept of marine heat waves was really, I guess, primed um, by some really nice work uh, in 2011, 2010, 11, around this marine heat wave off Western Australia. And the phrase, I guess the idea of a marine heat wave was coined well, a little bit before that time, but certainly around about that time by researchers in Western Australia. This was a particularly strong event, um, and it turns out later on I'll show you that it was what we would call a Category 4 event. Um, it had dramatic impacts on, um, I guess, biodiversity. Uh, the, the kelp uh, reduced from percent cover of around 80% or so down to 40-50% cover, and there was a tropicalization index where about, let's say on average, 10%, if you go back in time, of um, species in this region here would be considered to be tropical, increased at that time to closer to 20%. Most, most recently, or more recently, um, in 2015-16, there was a, a very large, unprecedented event off Tasmania, and you can see it over here. I'll talk about this a bit later on too. And it was a very long and intense event, um, not as intense as the Western Australian one, but it had dramatic impacts on um, oysters. So we had uh, the first incidence of Pacific Oyster Mortality Syndrome in this region. We had uh, farmed Atlantic salmon um, that were compromised and uh, there was mortality of uh, abalone during that time. And then if we think about um, in the, I guess, the North region and the Great Barrier Reef and uh, other regions around the world, um, coral bleaching is obviously uh, a problem and uh, is exacerbated by um, marine heat wave type events. So here from a paper by um, Terry Hughes and others, uh, we're just highlighting here the, um, let's say the stressor of degree heating. If I can just move this out of the way here degree heating uh, weeks. Um, so we've got, um, we've got uh, red here in this part here, uh, associated with Orpheus Island region, and red is in effect bad. So um, for this particular year in 1998, um, there was like seven um, degree heating weeks um, in that region. So that's causing stress. And you can see up here in the red, this is the bleaching that was actually, um, I guess, recorded during that time. And then if we go further um, along here um, into 2016, during the 2015-16 um, El Nino event, again, you can see that the stressor from degree heating weeks um, is in the sort of orange red zone up in the Lizard Island region. And during that time, um, again, it's red. Um, but here, during this period, it was like 16 degree heating weeks, which is in the red. 
and uh, and where where it shows red for bleaching, it's greater than sixty percent um, bleached uh, corals. So then, in two thousand and three, just to give you some context of other marine heat waves around the world, um, and then so this is going back in time now. You'll remember back in two thousand and three, there was a record atmospheric heat wave over Europe. Um, there were thousands of people um, who died in France and and Spain and other countries. And uh, it was, um, a, I guess, a really a record event. But it also had consequences for the Mediterranean Sea. So we've got here some, um, some pictures from a couple of papers. Uh, the Ligurian Sea is up in this region here. So if we look forward here from 2000, 2002, 2003 and 2004, you can see in the 2003 time, it was particularly red and particularly warm, two to three degrees warmer than normal. In the Tyrrhenian Sea, which is up in here, again, we're comparing 2002 to 2003, you can see that it, it's also uh, much warmer than normal. Um, so it's around two and a half degrees C warmer. Now, the depth of influence of uh, the marine heat wave at the time um, was relatively shallow. It's only down to about 20 metres depth. Um, and uh, the driver, if you like, the cause of that um, seemed to be uh, largely from the atmospheric heat wave at the time. So it was like a top-down warming from the atmosphere, um, heating up the surface region, but still had um, uh, dramatic effects on rocky reef communities, particularly sponges and soft corals. And then if we cast our mind back to the 2010-11 event in Western Australia again, it was about three degrees above seasonal values along the West Australian coast, from the region up here um, towards Ningaloo, around 22 degrees uh, south, down to Cape Lewin at about 34 south. And um, the, I guess the cause of that event, um, there, was a, there was a very, very strong La Nina at the time. So if we think about El Nino and La Nina, um, there was a strong La Nina at the time, but there were also more regional effects coming from changes in the winds um, that uh, acted to um, enhance, if you like, um, the warming during that particular time. And uh, we've already seen that figure. Another um, uh, heat wave uh, was 2012 in the Northwest Atlantic. You can see the scale of that event here off the Gulf of Maine and, and uh, in sort of the Gulf Stream region. Um, sea surface temperature anomalies peaked at three degrees uh, Celsius above seasonal values. Um, and it was also linked to atmospheric warming and a, a, a an unusual position of the Gulf Stream at that time. Um, from, a, from an economic point of view, um, there was a dramatic impact on um, lobster fishery. Um, I can just move this up here. I've got, uh, there's a dramatic impact on lobster fishery at the time. You can see that um, during the early onset period, the lobster landings were very, very large. So there was like a, a, a a bloom almost, or an incredible amount of lobster landings, which actually um, curiously acted to have a, a negative impact on the economics and caused um, significant tensions between US and Canada at the time. The market got flooded with lobster and the price dropped dramatically. So now um, in this slide here, um, we've got, um, a paper by uh, Dan Smale and others that, that I was a part of that looks at um, how marine heat waves threaten global biodiversity. So there are a number of uh, case studies that are actually undertaken in that particular study. Um, and some of those include um, looking at coral bleaching in the Caribbean, looking at seagrass density um, in, in Australia, and looking at giant kelp uh, biomass in California. So you can see from these figures here if we look across the x-axis, we're looking at marine heat wave days or marine heat wave days per year. And up the y-axis, we're looking at um, the response of, or the apparent response of those variables or the relationship with those variables. So if we're looking at coral bleaching, for example, you can see that as you increase the number of marine heat wave days, coral bleaching uh, records per year also commensurately increase. If we look at seagrass density in the Australian region, you can see that the density of seagrass um, has a relationship that reduces as marine heat wave days per year increase. And if we look at kelp biomass, um, you can see as marine heat, wave day, marine heat wave days per year increase, you can see there's also a giant kelp biomass um, reduction. 
So it led to this uh, statement um, over here on the left. Uh, to date, the main focus of ecological research has been on trends in, in mean climate variables, yet discrete extreme events are emerging as pivotal in shaping ecosystems by driving sudden and dramatic shifts in ecological structure and functioning. So one of the findings really of that work was that um, while um, trends in uh, ocean warming and, and climate change increase, it's these more discrete marine heat wave events or ocean temperature extremes that really um, do some, uh, quite a lot of the damage to ecosystems. Okay, this figure is uh, just um, uh, a figure from Hilary Scannell, um, and it's just, I guess, really updated with a couple of other um, events during that time. But you can see the events that I've just talked about, like the Mediterranean heat wave, the North Atlantic, um, the WA marine heat wave, and the Tasman Sea marine heat wave, and a couple of more in this, uh, like, chronology, if you like, um, is this South Central Pacific uh, heat wave that coincided with the Central Pacific El Nino at the time. And this very long um, and most recurrent uh, North Pacific um, marine heat wave from 2013 that sort of, in effect, uh, relaxed and came back right through to 2016. So to give you some definitions of what, we, what we're talking about, um, we can think about atmospheric heat waves and uh, the UK Met Office has a uh, I guess a, a definition on its site. Um, you know, we can think about marine heat waves as analogous to uh, um, atmospheric heat waves. Um, they're heat waves in the ocean rather than in the atmosphere. The time scale might be a little bit different. But the UK Met Office defines a heat wave as an extended period of hot weather relative to the expected conditions of the area at that time of year. The WMO, the World Met Organization, um, writes a marked unusual hot weather over a region persisting at least two consecutive days during the hot period of the year based on local climatological conditions with thermal conditions recorded above given thresholds. But what about a marine heat wave? Well, um, the Bureau of Meteorology has a sort of a social explainer on its website that says marine heat waves happen when sea temperatures are warmer than normal for an extended period, warmer waters for swimming and surfing. What's not to like? So, you know, you might find that um, somewhat amusing, but the reality is, of course, unfortunately quite a lot. The effect on marine life and the aquaculture industry can be devastating. So back in 2015, in January 2015, a group of uh, um, scientists, uh, of which I, I was one of them, got together like a marine heatwave working group. Um, and this was really, I guess, primed by the w Western Australian Marine Heat Wave. And uh, so we had our first workshop at the University of Western Australia. It was in January. It was somewhere between 35 and 40 degrees Celsius. So it was perfect conditions to be thinking about marine heat waves. And you can see there's uh, 14 uh, of us there. It was uh, a another gentleman who wasn't able to join us at the time who was in that group. And uh, there were three things we were looking at at the time. One was thinking about a marine heat wave definition. Another one was thinking about trends in marine heat waves. Um, and another one was look, uh, to consider drivers, what causes marine heat waves. And broadly, uh, so, so the people involved included uh, oceanographers, atmospheric scientists, and marine ecologists. So it was kind of an interdisciplinary um, group of people. So the definition is, is along the lines of an atmospheric um, heat wave, and, and I guess it really was uh, informed by those group of people, that it's a prolonged, discrete, anomalously warm water event in a particular location. And uh, if you start thinking about it more quantitatively rather than qualitatively, um, the definition then moved to the idea of persistence for at least five days, whereas um, the atmospheric community might think about an atmospheric heat wave being sort of two to three days at least well-defined start and end dates, and warmer than the 90th percentile in the 30-year baseline climatology. So on this figure on the right, then, we can think about, well, what, that, what does that mean? So here across the x-axis or the, the bottom axis, we've got time, and here up um, the vertical axis, we've got temperature. If we think about this blue line here, that's like the climatological mean. So you can imagine that the temperature overall on average varies as the seasons, okay? So this might be a summer period and then it goes down to winter and so on. So if you average overall time, you get this seasonal variability. 
But then above that, you've got what we call the 90th percentile threshold. So in other words, um, it's above which 10% of the uh, temperatures would be in the top 10% um, range. So this is, you know, in the extreme, if you like, above this 90th percentile. And uh, then we would think about, well, um, we need to be at least five days. So it would be from here, this start date to this end date. If it's in excess of five days, then it's classified as a marine heat wave. And the peak intensity would be the peak um, temperature above the climatology. And then with satellite um, sea surface temperature measurements, you can then apply that definition and, um, and revisit those historical events that I talked about. So here we've got the Western Australian event, we've got the Mediterranean event, and we've got the North Atlantic event. And so with that definition, then we could choose, let's say, a particular point in space and generate um, a history of um, temperature at that time and you can see over this period here from October 2010 through to say the middle of July or the middle of uh, 2011 or the end of 2011 you can see that we've got a series of warming events and then this particularly strong one that coincided with the 2011 Western Australian Marine heat wave. And then if you go down further we can then sort of have a look at the characteristics of that particular event and how it can fit compares with historical events during the satellite record. So we're going back to 1982 and you can see different events there um, characterized in terms of duration and intensity. So um, for this particular event in 2011 you can see that it wasn't the longest event for that particular region but it was certainly the most intense indicated here by this red bar. For the Northwest Atlantic, you can see that um, the uh, 2012 event was particularly intense and was uh, long by comparison with the history, whereas this uh, um, Mediterranean Sea one was indicated here by yellow. It wasn't the, necessarily the longest and it was pop about the same uh, as another event in terms of its intensity, but combined together, um, it uh, had dramatic effects. All right, so now moving on to trends. Um, so here we can look at um, marine heat wave frequency. And here we've, we look at the mean frequency of marine heat waves. It's indicated by this uh, color bar here. So we're going from off the order of zero to three and a half marine heat waves per year. And you can see the spatial distribution of these marine heat waves across the globe. So uh, where we have red, it's of, of the order of two and a half to three and a half marine heat waves per year. And you can see that this redness um, appears particularly in the, what we would call the Western boundary um, regions, um, where you get a lot of variability and, um, and uh, the currents tend to head polewards. And then if we look at uh, trends, this is again over the satellite record, we look at this picture here, um, where we've got this hash hashing, this, these lines, um, that's indicating statistically significant results. So we're looking at the change in frequency here from this period, 2000, 2016, minus 1982 to 1998. And you can see that over a fair part of the globe, um, the frequency of marine heat waves have actually gone into the red or have increased over time. Then if we look at a global average and we look at a long time series, you can see again over the satellite period from 1982 to 2015-16, you can see that all of the uh, parameters, if you like, of um, frequency, intensity and duration are trending upwards. And uh, as you uh, can well imagine, globally average sea surface temperature is also um, trending upwards. But you can also see on this, these figures, we've got some pink and blue indicated by El Nino periods in pink and La Nina periods in blue. And you can see that there are lumps uh, during um, uh, many of those events. So it shows that the El Nino Southern Oscillation Signature has an important role to play globally on uh, marine heat wave um, characteristics. So what we've tried to do then is um, remove uh, some of the effect of that uh, ENSO um, relationship by in effect taking it out as best as we can and uh, then you can see that in all those characteristics it's still trending up. 
And another thing was just to try and take it back in time to remove any uh, biasing or aliasing from the shortness of the record, but only back to 1982, by just trying to take it back to the early part of the century, looking at monthly long record sea surface temperature observations. Um, and, and that was done by a proxy relationship, looking at uh, frequency in terms of um, the number of months per year uh, where uh, sea surface temperatures were particularly strong or marine heat wave conditions. And then you can use that proxy relationship to then uh, take your record way back until the beginning of the century. And you can see that uh, it tracks pretty well against uh, daily sea surface temperatures um, by using this proxy method and gives us some confidence then that this particular map here on the left is reflective of marine heat wave trends over the longer period. Then um, if we think about projections here, this is work undertaken by uh, people in Europe, uh, Freulicher and others, um, and it just uh, shows how perhaps marine heat waves are um, going to change over time. So uh, again, I'll move this down here. Um, we've got uh, a global warming in effect uh, in terms of degree C here that's, uh, uh, I guess, projected to change in response to different um, emission scenarios. So if we think about the historical period plus this lower end um, emission scenario that's a bit more like Paris Agreement type, and then we've got this higher end emission scenario of 8.5, it's a bit more like um, what we're actually seeing. Um, then you can see that uh, we're, we're heading on a trajectory of global warming um, towards two degrees to four degrees Celsius that is going to change the probability, if you like, of marine heat waves occurring in the future. So in the uh, historical plus RCP 2.6, you can see that the, um, by the end of the 21st century, we're just basically um, aiming to be under two degrees warming, which would maybe increase the probability by about 20, um, 20 to one, if you like, um, of marine heat wave occurrence. But uh, if we go on the uh, red trajectory, you can see that by the same period, we're heading towards a four degree warming. And this is the spatial distribution then for those different types of um, warming events from, let's say this one here at two degree warming and this one here at three and a half degree warming. Another thing that uh, we were interested in um, was, uh, trying to better characterize uh, the intensity of marine heat waves. And so um, a discussion amongst um, some of the group members um, worked towards generating um, a categorization scheme for marine heat waves. And you can, you know, we, we could liken this in some ways to tropical cyclones where we talk about category one, category two um, cyclones. Um, this is a, a categorization scheme for marine heat waves where uh, the if you think about this is the distance between the background climatology and the 90th percentile, um, category one would be, um, you know, in effect one time, between one time and two times the 90th percentile difference to the climatology. And then category two would be two to three times, and then this would be three to four times. So we end up getting category one to category four, which we'd name moderate, strong, severe, and extreme. And then you can then think about the time duration that you, your, if we think about this as a time series of uh, temperature that's observed at a particular point, how long it resides in each of these different categories before it actually ends. So then we can revisit um, different marine heat waves around the world. And here's just two of those. There's the Tasman Sea one in 2015-16 and the Northeast Pacific one 2014-16. Um, and uh, you can generate sp spatial maps of intensity and also um, a time history of intensity for a particular location or for a particular average region. So if you see here in the Tasman Sea one, you can see that uh, in, in some smaller regions uh, within this blue box, we, we got up to severe or so, but on average, um, really, strong, let's say, a category two um, marine heat wave was uh, broadly what it reached over the broader region. In the Northeast Pacific, um, here, let's say identified by this box, you can see the history here where it got up to um, severe in this period here during this, I guess, winter period from February through to May. 
And then um, also uh, in this particular uh, published paper, um, then there's also a bit of a, a I guess, a, a table lookup of revisiting different events. And uh, I guess we can refer to, let's say, the Tasman Sea 2015 event and the Western Australian 2011 um, event. Um, and you can see if we look at duration, we've got this Tasman Sea event of 252 days, which is really off the charts. It's unprecedented. Um, and this Western Australian marine heat wave here, that's only 66 days. But if we look here across these columns, then we're going um, to the proportion of time that it was within let's say the moderate through to extreme periods. So you can see that the Tasman Sea Marine heat wave, while it was 252 days, it was more um, time spent in the moderate um, or category one level um, and a bit less in the strong. Whereas in the Western Australian Marine heat wave, you can see 12% of the time it was in extreme and 12% of the time it was in severe. Okay. So um, what about drivers of marine heat waves? What, what causes them? Well, like, marine, like heat waves over land, heat waves in the ocean come about from a mix of factors. And, and really this is uh, from the uh, Bureau of Meteorology website. Um, on the right hand side, we've got the 2017-18 um, marine heat wave uh, uh, shown here. So we've had a, a few in the last few years in this region. But in this orange here, really, I guess these are the key messages. Sunlight passes through the atmosphere and heats the surface of the ocean. That's one key mechanism. And the other one is that just simply warm water moves from one location to another into a cooler location. So we can think about that warm water moving in as a current, or we, we call that advection, bringing warm water into the region and acting to um, influence the temperature of, of the box that it goes into and similarly um, sunlight that's um, adding heat to the surface of the uh, ocean. And so this figure then considers um, the kind of factors then that uh, would cause a marine heat wave. So if, this, if we consider this box, if you like, here um, as a, a, a schematic of what might cause this warming here expressed at the sea surface, the two key elements that are really, uh, I guess, shown in that um, Bureau of Meteorology website is one is this net surface heating from the surface or net surface heat flux, we call it. And the other is this, this current flow, if you like, um, advection into uh, the box that acts to heat it up and cause um, temperature change. So that's what's really happening locally. But it's this right hand side here that gives us our potential for prediction, let's say, predictability. So it's, you know, the remote uh, drivers, the things that are coming from somewhere else. Um, these like planetary scale ocean waves, which I don't have time really to go into. Um, uh, ones that might go along the equator here, ones that might propagate from east to west across the uh, basin here. So this is longitude across here and this is time so you can see this east to west in time propagation that um, changes the circulation of the western region and can affect um, temperature change in there and what actually uh, drives some of this well it can be the way that the climate changes and the winds change and we can link that back to what we call climate modes so things like el nino southern oscillation or the southern annular mode or the indian ocean dipole Madden Julian oscillation. They're all climate modes that act to um, generate uh, and modulate this um, box, if you like, and the temperatures that uh, come into this box more locally. So, here I'm just going to show a little movie of um, temperatures changing here um, in the Tasman Sea. You focus on this region down here in the Tasman Sea, you can see that there's a lot of transient changes in temperature all over the place, but you can see that there's a sort of a, almost like a persistence of warming in this region here. Okay, so again, if I move this out of the way. Um, so we're going through to February, you can see February, March 2016, how it's really particularly warm. And then the movie will stop in a moment. So right at the end of the movie here, 
you'll see that uh, temperatures were even up to three to five degrees warmer in certain regions um, of the Tasman Sea. There's a lot of movement all over the place, but this region was particularly influenced by um, the East Australian current, and I'll come to that now. Okay, so this uh, slide um, shows then um, a summary, if you like, of uh, this particular event. It was the longest and most intense marine heat wave on record in the region. It commenced in uh, September 2015 and went through to May 2016, and it lasted for more than eight months. It reached a maximum of intensity of close to three degrees, and it had profound impacts on marine ecosystems and economy, in particular the ones that I talked about earlier, the oyster, the abalone, and um, the salmon. But um, what actually um, happened during that time? Well, analysis, uh, like a temperature or heat budget analysis um, within the box, the type of box that I showed, you can analyze the um, contribution then from the sea surface uh, temperature being caused by um, air sea um, heat fluxes from, from the atmosphere and also from um, the ocean currents coming in. If we look at uh, climatology um, here from sort of September to April, May, um, on average, you can see that the temperature within a volume down to 100 metres uh, depth is contributed fairly evenly by um, ocean current contribution and also atmospheric heating from the surface, this blue and this red line. But in 2015-16, you can see that it was largely due to this blue line here and this red line was less influential. And when you look at the difference then between 2015, 16 and um, climatology, you can see that the blue tracks the black very well. So it was really ocean advection um, from the East Australian current uh, extension here that pushes further south and brings uh, transports, warm water in eddies down to this region that was particularly intense during that time and gives us then some hope towards potential predictability because potential predictability um, is largely going to come from um, the ocean where the time scales are slower, whereas the atmosphere is very fast, and so your predictability is going to be much shorter. And uh, one of the last things I want to say just before I just say a little bit more about um, finally predictability is that um, IMOS, the Integrated Marine Observing System, um, uh, which is a national, um, I guess, facility, um, has uh, uh, I guess initiated um, work around event-based sampling of marine heat waves and most recently they've been doing um, little glider runs um, along the uh, Tasmanian coast um, to try and understand the most recent marine heat wave and you can see here these are sea surface temperature percentiles in March 2019. So not only did we have the 2015-16 marine heat wave event, we've had a 2017-18 and a 2018-19 marine heat wave and you can see that this redness here um, is sort of uh, reflective of that. Okay, so, um, so then uh, re more recently um, as part of NESP we've been trying to understand what the potential is to um, predict marine heat waves and just try to get our heads around this a little bit more. And this has been um, work um, collect together with um, uh, I guess collaborators here and at CSIRO, um, CSIRO um, Decadal Prediction System which has been led by Terry O'Kane and, um, and uh, this is work uh, that we're trying to do where we're in effect applying the, the development work of the Decadal Prediction System um, uh, and, and try to understand whether there's potential to predict marine heat waves on sort of one to 10 year timescales. So, but the earlier work here is just trying to understand where potential predictability might come from. So if we just look at two sites, again, going back to um, the southwest and the southeast of Australia, and we look at, let's say, how El Nino variations um, occur since 1982-83 to 2015-16. And if we look at the Western Australian region, identified by um, this coordinate here, you can see when it's in red, it's an El Nino event. When it's in blue, it's a La Nina event. And you can see that uh, if we look at this probability distribution here on the right-hand side, where zero is in effect the mean, to get temperatures in the positive end, in other words, sea surface temperature anomalies that are warm, 
In the Western Australian region, it coincides with La Nina events. And this is uh, not something new. This has been well written about by researchers in Western Australia, Ming Feng and others. Um, and in the, uh, uh, the negative end, you can see that El Nino events um, tend to be, uh, uh, I guess, symptomatic of, of cooling. So you can see it's a very coherent relationship, in fact. Um, when temperatures are warmer, it tends to be La Nina. When temperatures are cooler, it tends to be El Nino. In the Tasman Sea, um, it's a little bit uh, more varied. You can see that there's not, not such a coherent relationship with El Nino phase and La Nina phase. But in fact, uh, both phases can contribute to warming and that takes it down to the tail of the distribution. So ENSO still plays a role, but it's a little bit more complicated. And so um, this figure, I, I, I'm not going to really spend any time on, but, but there's been work here trying to understand what the potential predictability is of um, uh, sea surface temperature anomalies around the region, around Australia. Um, this is a paper in preparation. But uh, the potential to predict, in other words, if you think about a perfect model for how um, temperature might um, change or respond, a lot of the sort of longer time scale predict, uh, potential to predict comes from the ocean. It's the memory of the climate system. And not only is the ocean have, have the memory and, and the time scales that can pot potentially give us predictability on, on years longer than one year, um, also, when you go to the higher latitudes, you, can, you tend to get uh, potential predictability that's even longer as well. And so this analysis suggests that, that maybe we have potential predict, to predict with a perfect model, let's say, um, of, of multi-year timescales. And that's really then the connection with um, the decadal prediction system work of Terry O'Kane and others at CSIRO as part of NESP. So Terry would be much better placed to explain this figure since it's the decadal prediction system called CAFE, the Climate Analysis Forecast Ensemble developed uh, through the Decadal Forecasting Project. But uh, just to keep it short, um, basically the, uh, the, the system assimilates data um, the, and you can see there's various types of, the, of data from the ocean here, Argo, XVT, CTD, satellite SST and so on. Um, takes it in, and if you just focus on these red parts from the ocean, set up an initialization where you've got an ensemble, a group of simulations that you would run forward um, and set up the initial conditions and then forecast forward um, in a probabilistic way for how the change might happen on sort of one to 10 year timescales. And this is some of the uh, initial results that uh, we've been looking at in terms of marine heat wave changes um, for the Western Australian region and also the Tasman Sea. So here you can see in this early part here, this is the initialization period, okay, through to 2007. Okay, and then what we've got is a free running forecast um, running out over the next four years. So while unfortunately this simulation doesn't take us to the right to the 2011 marine heat, heat wave event for Western Australia, because um, the forecast is shorter than that, we can at least focus on this 2008 period here, okay? All right, so, so if we look at the red line, this is just like a, sort of a background reanalysis um, uh, representation. But the blue line is a genuine ensemble forecast and the spread is indicated by this um, light blue. So if we look at observations here, here's the Western Australian region for Feb February 2008. And within this box, it looks like that, okay? And if we look at the uh, decadal prediction system forecast and we characterize the ocean temperatures, um, sea surface temperature anomalies, it looks like that. So. So while the uh, decadal prediction system doesn't necessarily have the structure indicated in the observations because it's only representing that one degree um, resolution, um, the overall broad characteristics are there and the, uh, the um, overall scale in terms of the anomaly is, is reasonably similar. Even though it looks a bit broader, um, the, the total um, anomaly is, is uh, surprisingly quite um, robust. And then if we look at the Tasman Sea region, um, then this is for the same period. So this is the same simulations, if you like. And you can see that uh, it's, again, the uh, decadal prediction system is capturing the background state 
And we're just going to focus now here on 2010. So in this earlier period marine heat wave that's uh, indicated here in black, um, the decadal prediction system didn't, didn't really get it at all. And, uh, and we suspect that that's because the uh, forcing for that particular event was atmospheric. And there's no hope that um, a decadal prediction system can really capture um, uh, an atmospherically forced uh, event. But in terms of the ocean background state where the ocean memory does play a role, it seems like it's actually done a remarkable job of getting this 2010 um, type event um, a few years in advance. And I, I still can't um, quite get my head around um, how successful this appears, whether this is, you know, um, uh, you know, one you might argue by chance or really uh, just a function of the um, ability of the model to capture the background ocean state that underpins and the ocean heat content that um, is able to capture this um, quite realistically. And again, you can see here's the observations here on the left and here's the uh, model simulation on the right. All right, I'm just about at the end, so I think I'm on time. Um, so then finally then, um, this is just uh, from some work um, in 2018, um, just looking at uh, variability and downscaling. Um, so if you can think about, let's say the Tasman Sea event that I just talked about, and here we're just showing 2010 um, period for that particular marine heat wave, then um, the, there's an Eastern Tasmania model um, that uh, I guess was implemented. It's a CSIRO model. It comes from the uh, sparse hydrodynamic ocean code of CSIRO. Um, and it was set up with, together with CSIRO by um, my colleague, Eric Oliver. And, uh, and you can see that um, when you have uh, offshore let's say higher res reasonably high resolution um, ocean model um, simulation, and then you downscale it here to the shelf on up down to scales of about two degrees, you can start to see the influence of um, uh, the ocean circulation and the heating, let's say, across the shelf that might give us some hope to be able to then connect the longer time scale, larger scale simulations of let's say the decadal prediction system then down to scales that might be uh, um, relevant uh, to uh, coastal, coastal work. All right, so summary um, and the take home messages. Marine heat waves can have substantial impacts on biodiversity fisheries and aquaculture. I think that's um, fairly clear. And I guess I really talked about that in terms of the uh, impacts around mer various marine heat waves around the world. Um, and focus uh, more regionally on um, the Southwest and the Tasman Sea. And certainly in the Tasmanian region, you know, the fisheries and aquaculture industries are particularly um, uh, impacted by um, temperature uh, extremes. Marine heat waves have been increasing in frequency, intensity and duration, and they're project projected to continue. Drivers of marine heat waves, the causes of them are really, um, from locally, uh, air sea heat fluxes, so atmosphere heating of the ocean, but also ocean currents advection. And uh, the potential for predictability really comes from our understanding of the climate modes and their drivers and the way that they connect to the local regions through oceanic teleconnections. And finally, I just want to say that the uh, CAFE decadal prediction system um, really does appear to offer uh, potential for multi-year forecasts. And we're just at the cusp of trying to understand that better. And um, CSIRO, I think, are doing a terrific job of developing that um, capability. Um, and what this uh, presentation has tried to do is just show that um, there is potential application for that in the ocean temperature extreme space. Um, finally, uh, the, we, there is a, a Marine Heatways Working Group, which is effectively the collection of people um, that I uh, talked about earlier. And uh, there's a website there if you're interested to get more information about Marine Heatways and some of the work that's been done by various people around the world. And I'll leave it there and I'll open up for uh, questions. Fabulous. Thanks, Neil. Thanks for a really informative uh, webinar. We do have uh, quite a number of really great questions, so we might go straight into it. So I'll just read out the question that's been posted in the chat box and then um, lead over to Neil. <coughs> so the first question 
is, uh, is the fishing industry pulling on researchers to project how their sector will be impacted as these marine heat waves increase in frequency or intensity, or is it not on their radar? Is the fishing industry, uh, could you just repeat it? Is the fishing uh, industry- Pulling on researchers, so using researchers and, and, and data. Um, I think the fishing industry are um, taking account of that, but what I think we're really trying to offer here is something that's um, more, let's say, immediate. So, so you can think about long-term uh, uh, projections and, and you can think about those, when we talk about projections versus predictions, you can talk about projections through the 2100 of the type that I talked about. So, so in terms of, um, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, how changes in circulation and, uh, um, and long-term changes in circulation and long-term heating is affecting, I think it's fair to say that the fishing industry are paying attention to that and they are thinking about that long-term. And, and at least through my work through the Marine Adaptation Network um, some years back, um, there was tremendous buy-in um, or at least, uh, you know, increased awareness from, from the industry and uh, uh, a keenness to understand how their practices were going to be affected by, by that. On the, on the shorter term, uh, what we're talking about here is the opportunities for potentially um, fisheries and aquaculture and biodiversity to respond on sort of, you know, year to, to let's say, 10 year time scale. So maybe they, you know, if we had, if we had a perfect El Nino forecast and we knew um, one year in advance that something was going to happen or two years in advance that something was going to happen, they could modify their practice. Um, and the other thing is, is if you think about the really short time scales, if you go to the, you know, sort of weeks to, to two weeks to a month, you know, even maybe an, aqua, um, an oyster farm could respond by lifting their oysters out of the water or something like that. So, so there are various scales in which, um, you know, marine stakeholders can respond. And there's the long-term uh, planning horizon for long-term change where we're on a trajectory where, you know, things are going to be really potentially dire, uh, but there are, might be opportunities in other areas where, you know, things aren't going to be so dire and, and people can respond. And, and so long-term planning horizons are going to be important. But the, I think what we're really trying to get to here is trying to understand, well, on the near term, in sort of the zero to 10 year time scale, what can people potentially do? And I think there's, there could be real opportunities there because the variations um, can be quite dramatic, right? From year to year, they can be much larger than even the long-term trend. So, so there are real opportunities there, I think. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Paul who asks, how does increased ocean acidification interact with marine heat waves? We've looked at. So it, we haven't really looked at the interaction between marine heat waves per se and uh, ocean acidification, but, but, but it's fair to say that ocean acidification is, um, you know, a real problem and uh, combined with um, marine heat wave is potentially problematic, but for different reasons, right, in terms of skeleton building um, organisms and so on. So, so you, I guess you're thinking about the combination then of um, what that would mean, let's say, for coral reefs or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but this, so um, another uh, question is around, are the level of financial losses in aquaculture known from past events? And are these projectable into the future? Um, I don't know what the economics is around uh, <laughs> um, aquaculture industries. I think the aquaculture industries, um, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's really things that they, that they keep, uh, for themselves, really. I mean, they 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 manage their own um, industries, but um, but you could imagine then that if we if we get into more of a, a, a I guess a more permanent marine heat wave state, and you know salmon is being compromised by um, ocean temperature extremes and more persistent warming, um, you know viruses that are exacerbated by um, warm water events are going to become more prevalent 
um, that you know that that aquaculture industries are going to have to think very carefully about where their farms are located. Um, you know whether they be near shore, whether they be offshore, um, where the refuges are, and so on. So. Um, you know, I don't have any of the figures in front of me with regards to economic losses per se for individual um, growers, but, but I think it's fair to say that um, there are going to be challenges ahead for fisheries and agriculture industries, and I think they're well aware of that. Great, thank you. So the next one comes from David Caroli, who asks, are marine heat waves more common in the continental shelf regions where the ocean depth is shallower? than in the central ocean regions? Again, that's, that's a, this, so, so there's only really um, work um, starting to be underway with regards to um, shallow water environments. And so when you think about um, um, the connection to climate modes, let's say, we can characterize marine heat waves globally, but um, the, the um, responses on the shelf are harder to um, get your handle on until you use at least high resolution simulations or have better observations on the shelf. So we can look at individual uh, moorings, let's say, and look at how temperature extremes occur at individual locations, but they're very, very sparse in space. With the uh, better observing systems that have been underway and um, that I guess are now being provided by IMOS, um, the better modelling systems that we have and the down dynamical downscaling that we might be able to provide in the future, I think we're going to get a better handle then on how marine heat waves are going to impact on the shelf. And that one of the last slides that I showed there shows that potential capability that we'd be looking at where we might be able to at least get down to a, a couple of kilometre scales without necessarily going into estuaries, let's say where um, oysters are. Um, that would be another level again but at least start to get down to the scales that really, um, I guess, uh, provide the information that stakeholders need to uh, make proper decisions. So, so really, I guess the answer to David's question is, um, marine heat waves can be quite large in scale, and you've seen the sort of scale that I showed in some of the figures today. And really, the, the type of figure that I showed towards the end there, where you connect the open ocean to the shelf, comes through um, cross-shelf transports of ocean eddies, let's say, and um, from bringing the warm water, let's say, from the East Australian current onto the shelf. And, and from, from the work that we've done so far, we're confident that that, that is actually taking place. There is uh, off uh, shelf exchange, cross-shelf exchanges that brings warm water onto the shelf and infiltrates into the um, coastal domain. So, but um, the level of statistics of that and just how much it's happening is still to be really understood. Yeah, great, thanks. So um, the next question is around, um, in relation to the climatology available, the 30 years of expected conditions, how do you account for recent extreme events within the climatology? Do you leave them in the climatology and does this influence the marine heat wave metrics? Um, so for example, extreme events, will they increase the historical average? Yeah, it's one thing that um, has to be considered quite carefully and there's work underway by various people to try and do that. T historically, people have chosen a particular climate um, climatology, um, let's say a 30 year period from what, what it might be from 1980 to 2010 or 1960 to 1990 as, as it might have been in the past. Um, but as we, we move forward, um, we need to start be starting thinking about um, moving more of a sliding climatology to, to, in effect, readjust to try and understand changes. And I think there's going to be real challenges ahead in that way because what we're moving from is a case where we have marine heat wave events in terms of frequency, and then they're going to become more often, and then they're going to become a permanent state, right? So because um, we're, we're looking at things relative to how it was. And then you start to think about things like um, how fast um, uh, ecosystems might adapt. So, so these open up a whole new range of questions around um, adaptation timescales of different species versus um, the rate at which uh, marine heat waves are increasing and the rate at which temperatures overall are increasing. So um, 
yeah, so I think there's a lot of things to consider and a lot of uh, challenges ahead to um, try and um, respond to. Yep, okay. Um, the next one from Louise is, is there a link between marine heat waves and eutrophic events? Uh, I don't know the answer to that um, myself. <laughs> um, I think I'll leave that one for the ecologists. <laughs> okay, no worries. As a physical oceanographer. Yep. <laughs> uh, so another one from David we have is, you've used a percentile threshold for marine heat waves above the 90th percentile mainly. However, for coral bleaching, an absolute threshold, so how many degree days above climatology month, month high temperature is used, which method is better or does that depend on the application? I think it really depends on the application and, and, and David points to an important thing here. Um, what we've tried to do with the percentile threshold is be, um, uh, uh, have a unif almost like a unifying definition that uh, can be considered across everything so that we can apply um, sea surface temperature from um, satellite records to try and understand um, uh, things more uh, broadly. Um, and, and we don't know um, necessarily from species to species what their critical thresholds are. So, um, so I think it's really important, you know, for the ecologists going forward and, and I guess oceanographers and climate scientists to work together to better understand those uh, critical thresholds for different species so that maybe some um, more tailored uh, um, uh, definitions can be applied for that particular species. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Well, I think we've gotten through most of the questions now and we're just about out of time. So we might wrap up. Um, thanks again, Neil, for a really great webinar. Um, much appreciated. And thank you everyone for attending and for your great questions as well. Um, just a little note that they'll, the Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub will be having a bit of a break with their webinars next month, a bit of an end of financial year holiday. But we'll start up the webinars again in July. So the next webinar will be on the 16th of July and it'll be provided by Dr. Rebecca Morris from the National Centre for Coasts and Climate around nature-based coastal defences. So more information on that webinar will be provided to you all next month. And um, a last note, just to remind you all that a recording of the webinar will be provided on the Hub's website by the end of the week. So for those people who've had a little bit of trouble uh, logging on, um, do head to our website, to the uh, Science Webinar website, and um, there'll be a recording there by Friday at least. And finally, if you've got any questions or queries to Neil or myself or the Hub in general, please contact us. There's a few contact details on that final slide there. We're always happy to connect and to provide any information. Um, and that's it for today. Thanks for attending and we hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.